<laughs> Thanks, Renee. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Yay. Excellent. Well, welcome to day two. Thanks for uh, joining us here today. Thanks for joining us uh, at TechCon. Again, great event. I was really pleased with how uh, yesterday went. I thought we had a great day. Uh, talking about a lot of, a lot of exciting stuff. Of course, we launched some uh, new products yesterday. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, great presentations. It was good to have uh, Massa here on stage. Uh, Mike gave, as usual, a very uh, entertaining presentation about uh, his own personal life and how these various animals are sniffing him to try and work out uh, what's going to go on in his body over time. I think he actually pays extra for that, I've got to say. Um, and, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about, about technology. Great technical papers uh, yesterday, really strong lineup um, contributed by all of you, so thank you for that. Um, and you also got to hear from uh, and meet my new boss yesterday. Uh, it was great to have him with us um, and have him here on stage to talk about uh, his vision of the future and why ARM was so important for that. Now, when I introduced uh, Massa yesterday, I talked about how excited I am uh, about ARM's future uh, and how excited I am to partner with him. He is a, a fascinating guy who thinks in the biggest terms possible, uh, and it's a very exciting time to, to be in ARM and, and I think to be part of the ARM partnership. Um, you heard yesterday uh, about some of the technologies. You heard Mike talk about where things are going generally. You just heard from Jem about uh, computer vision. You heard from Greg yesterday uh, talking about Moore's Law and some of the challenges in just making transistors ever, ever smaller and higher performance. So great technologies, um, and we're committed to delivering those technologies. But really what they are, when you think about that, is the building blocks that other people are going to innovate around. Jim just mentioned that right now. You know, we have all of these different components that can be put together on a chip. They are tools, they are building blocks for others to go and innovate with. Others, i.e. all of you hopefully here today, you're going to take those things that we do uh, and create something really spectacular with them. So our job is to work on those building blocks, those tools, and to deliver them to you, to put those tools in your hands so you can innovate and build even more phenomenal products than the kind of thing that we, worked, uh, that we have today. So that's what makes my job fascinating. It is, as much as I love the individual technology components that we're building, it's seeing what other people do with them and seeing how uh, new products emerge. That's the really uh, fascinating part. And as well as building the technology itself, it's, it's enabling access to it, enabling uh, higher and higher performance at lower and lower cost. Um, that is really what enables innovation to thrive. And we're seeing that impact many, many different end markets. Now, I think this phenomena is summed up really well here in this quote. Lots of people have talked about this phenomena. Now, this quote is from uh, Helen Mirren. Now, Helen Mirren is uh, an actor, one of the uh, most famous actors uh, from the UK, famous for playing the Queen in a movie called The Queen. And you may be thinking, well, what's somebody like that doing, thinking about technology? Well, she was an, at an event where she was asked, you know, what's technology going to do in your sort of, uh, of line of work? And she's talking here about uh, the lower barriers um, drive, lower barriers to access drive innovation, uh, and that is in itself a phenomenal uh, thing to see. And this demonstrates, again, how the combination of uh, technology and other industries come together uh, to create innovation. And we see this all the time. You look at the, you know, Jen mentioned the, the volume of data that gets up, uploaded to YouTube. Um, that's user-generated content, which 20 years ago would have been nigh on impossible to do. Um, we're seeing in lots of areas. This is an example of technology and the arts coming together. Uh, we see smartphone recorded uh, footage as commonplace uh, on the news to, uh, you know, every night. And we see it in music as well. Um, that clip of music that was, uh, that was playing as I walked on is an example of, of uh, electronic dance music that's being created today by thousands and thousands of people all over the world. Now, when I grew up, uh, synthesizers were starting to become commonplace uh, in the creation of music, but if you wanted to make something like that, you needed lots of them, you needed expensive equipment, you needed a recording studio, and that was frankly out of the range of most people. Now that particular clip was made by my son, who's 11, and he did that with nothing more than his laptop and some headphones. Fortunately with the headphones, because he makes a lot of noise doing it. Now, I don't know if he's going to become the next Calvin Harris, but I think it's quite phenomenal that 
a teenager, well, not even a teenager, in his bedroom can create music, and we're seeing that become uh, a really driving force in innovation in the music industry. So it's happening all over the place. And what we've seen through ARM's history is how uh, these successive waves of computing, these successive waves of new technologies, um, make it more and more accessible for people, and computing gets closer and closer to people. We've seen it with the rise of PCs, we've absolutely seen it in spades with the growth of smartphones, and we're now seeing it uh, with the growth of the Internet of Things. So each successive wave of technology brings it closer to people and it creates more and more opportunities on a global scale. Um, as well as the computing getting better, it's also becoming invisible. And when I went to university, if you wanted to use a computer, you know, you really knew you were using a computer. It was there, a big thing, you maybe had to rent time on it, book time, go in an air-conditioned room that some guy in a suit would uh, kind of look, be looking over your shoulder the whole time. What we're seeing now is computers are everywhere, and the Internet of Things is going to take computing uh, on a global basis and provide more opportunity uh, for more people. So the opportunities are increasing, opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurialism. So, I believe that the Internet of Things is going to create an enormous impact. It's going to create, I believe, more impact than everything else that's gone on in computing before. So in ARM, we've spent a lot of time thinking about IoT and what it's doing and, and uh, you know, how it's, how it's progressing. So, in, in analysing this, you know, we talked to a lot of people, but we thought we'd go out and actually get some data. And this is a, a work that started uh, more than three years ago now. The Internet of Things is, is relatively new still, it's in its infancy, there's still a lot of hype around it. Um, I get you know, comments to me all the time, are we always going to be five years away from the Internet of Things? Um, so this gathering of data is helping us plot a course and see where we are. Now, as I said, we started this three years ago, and if you came to TechCon in 2013, um, you'd have seen me talk about uh, this piece of work, uh, a work study that we commissioned in partnership with the Economist uh, Intelligence Unit, where we went out and we surveyed companies around the world. We went to talk to 750 different companies to ask them what they thought about IoT, uh, where they were in their development of this technology, how they thought it was going to impact uh, their business. So at the time, yeah, three years ago, uh, IoT very, very new. So I presented the results, stood on this stage three years ago, um, and one of the key things that came out of it was there was a lot more going on than, than anybody actually thought. Um, one of the key statistics that came out of the report um, was this one. Of the 750 companies that we spoke to, 95% of them expected that uh, IoT, that they would be using IoT in their business within three years. So here we are three years later, 2016. What do you think happened? Do you think 95% of companies are using IoT today? <laughs> no, I'm not hearing lots of positive, uh, overwhelming yeses out of the audience here. So we went and we've uh, just uh, uh, repeated this, this survey to go and ask largely the same questions. We went to talk to another 750 companies, um, and what we found of those 750, 75% um, of companies are uh, being impacted in some way by IoT. Now, I don't think that's bad. You know, 95% of companies thought they would. Actually, 75% of companies are. You know, if you kind of de-factor for um, hyper newness, I think that's not a bad result. When you look into it, though, what you see is less than half of those companies uh, that, that are being impacted by IoT um, have they had a significant impact. For the other companies, it's, it's kind of minor so far. So, all right, well, that's, that's not bad progress, I think. Um, so, you know, what's going on? What, why is it that uh, all companies aren't using IoT yet? What are the barriers to it? Well, there's lots of questions in this, uh, in this report, and you'll get to see that. Um, the study does, does a breakdown of some of the statistics. Um, and these are the, the, the key areas uh, that people cite as barriers to the adoption uh, of IoT. Security unsurprisingly, and uh, if you've been following the news recently, very unsurprising, uh, is highlighted as a, as a barrier to the adoption of IoT. About 26% of companies uh, say that that is an issue for them. Uh, cost is another issue. Uh, how do you create this end-to-end -end system? How much of this stuff have I got to do myself because there aren't great tools out there to help me? Now, these two factors, security and cost, 
uh, are absolutely what we're trying to address with the technologies that we launched yesterday. Embed Cloud is there to help with both security and cost. The, the innovations that we're providing at the IP level to enable you to build secure devices are absolutely there to help with both cost and, of course, security. So, you know, we're trying to work on that. Knowledge is an interesting one. Three years ago, the study uh, highlighted uh, a skills gap. People concerned about access to the right people with the right skills to help them develop IoT. Here, the category of uh, people um, where the knowledge was a question was actually senior management. <coughs> senior management, you know what they're like. I mean, what do they know? Now, if you're thinking, yeah, my boss actually doesn't really know one end of a server from a sensor, then you know, we can help. Again, you know, we don't have a product for that person, uh, but if uh, him or her you know, needs help understanding how uh, what IoT is all about, then have them come to this event. Uh, have them come to other events that uh, many others in the industry are putting on to enable um, transfer of knowledge and learning uh, about IoT. Because I think it's a technology that can positively impact every business. Now, this is a taster of the data. The full report will be out uh, in a month or so. Uh, we'll publicize that, you'll be able to download it. And again, leave hard copies on the, on the desk of your boss. Um, you know, help with that knowledge transfer, help, uh, help play a role uh, in getting people up the learning curve. So this report is great. I want to thank uh, The Economist and also IBM, who we partnered with uh, to put this together. Uh, we'll make the data available uh, soon. So it's good progress, and, and I think this is uh, very exciting. Um, Mike mentioned this yesterday, but our own journey in IoT goes back to about 2001, um, and it wasn't about wearables or tracking health, anything like that. It was about toast. <laughs> and uh, Mike mentioned this yesterday in his presentation back in 2001. Uh, he was out you know, trawling uh, for, for uh, interesting people doing interesting things, as he does, uh, and came across some university researchers making what then was called an internet appliance. Uh, to print the weather uh, on your toast in the morning. Now, that was, that was interesting, it was a bit of fun at the time, uh, but it did inspire uh, an R&D project uh, within ARM, uh, not to focus on the problems of uh, toast, uh, but uh, more crucial to the uh, innovation process, uh, and that is coffee. So, the team had one of these nice little coffee machines with the capsules, and the problem was, how do you track how many capsules are being used and when to reorder and can we automatically reorder the capsules uh, when they're running out. Uh, so being a bunch of clever people, they, they uh, knocked up um, uh, some, some electronics, some uh, uh, web-based uh, uh, software uh, to track the use of coffee in the R&D lab. Now, if you were here two years ago, 2014, uh, Mike described how this journey and how it's led us to what we announced yesterday with Embed Cloud. You want a device, you want it to measure something, you want to track data in the cloud, that sounds really simple. But when you get into the complexities of securing it and making it easy uh, so that everyone can build products, not necessarily like this, but leverage the full capabilities of IoT, there's a ton of stuff, ton of detail that you need to work out. And Embed Cloud is there to help solve some of the foundational problems, again, so that others can then go and innovate on top. Now, continuing this, uh, this journey through TechCons, if you were here uh, last year, you will know that toast, or rather toasting, uh, was a central theme of my keynote, but not on purpose. Um, if you were here last year, you may remember right in the middle of my presentation, I hit click on the clicker and the fire alarms went off. <laughs> now, fire alarms are uh, pretty simple things. They detect a problem, they make a lot of noise, everybody leaves, the fire, uh, fire department turns up and, and works out if there's a real problem or not. And if you were here, I want to thank you all for uh, diligently leaving the room in a very orderly way, and also thank you for coming back afterwards when we did get the all clear. Um, it, it turned out that somebody had left a bagel in a toaster and walked away from it, and the fire alarm, of course, assumed the worst. Now, these things do happen. But like I say, the technology is pretty simple. And maybe using some of that uh, computer vision technology that Jen was just talking about, we can have something a bit more sophisticated. In a high-risk area like a kitchen, having a camera look at what's going on, assess how much risk there is, you know, assess whether somebody has just walked away from the toaster. Um, you know, this is, these are ways in which we can make uh, security and safety systems more intelligent by just analyzing what the camera's looking at. 
not just streaming video into the cloud uh, in a dumb way, but actually analyzing the scene and looking for anomalies and then taking steps as a result of that. Now you could also argue, well, a smarter toaster might not have burnt it in the first place, or a smarter human wouldn't have left the bagel in the toaster and just walked away. Uh, but, you know, things like this happen, you know, un unexpected events do happen, and I think intelligent technology um, can help us deal with this in a, in a quick and safe way. But we're only going to do that with a, with a full end-to-end -end system. Um, now, what the report uh, shows that we've just done with the, uh, the Economist and, and IBM is that industry really is serious about adopting IoT. Three years ago, when we first did this, it was unclear exactly how this was going to pan out. But when I look at that report, uh, when I look at the kind of responses to some of the questions, it is clear that industry is very, very serious about this. And whether it's bagels and toasters or coffee or, or healthcare or agriculture, um, the benefits of IoT come from putting an end-to-end -end system together. Device, network, getting the right information into the cloud, analyzing it, analyzing it in the right way, pairing it with other data, combining that together, getting some insight and some knowledge. But to deliver that end-to-end -end system is still going to require a lot of innovation. It's going to require innovation in devices, in the network, in the cloud, in the algorithms that run on top of this. And, and I think that uh, innovation is, is still very alive and well and absolutely necessary. So I think as an industry, we don't really know what it's going to take to put a trillion devices onto the internet. And you think of it, a trillion devices, that is a lot. That's going to generate a lot of data, as we've seen from some of the, the projections. And how are we going to deal with that through the network? How are we going to deal with storing it in the cloud? How are we going to deal with analyzing it? Now, this is, uh, this is uncharted territory for the industry, and it's going to require um, a lot of innovation. So we're on this in terms of those, those uh, foundational elements, those building blocks, those tools, uh, and we're going to need the whole industry to work together to solve some of these, uh, these problems. So what we're seeing right now, Massa talks about this Cambrian explosion. We are seeing we are in this phase. We're not post-Cambrian. We are in it right now where there's a lot of experimentation going on because access to the key building blocks is really low cost. Um, and that experimentation is great. We're seeing it in lots of different areas. It's driving a lot of potential. Um, here's, a, here's an example of some of that experimentation I came across a couple of weeks ago. You may have seen this. Uh, this is a, a collaboration going on between Google and uh, Chipotle, the uh, uh, burrito food chain, who are trying to solve the problem of how you deliver burritos with drones. Um, they're working on the campus of Virginia Tech to deliver burritos to students. Now, you may think this is the most first world problem you could possibly think of, uh, but it isn't really about feeding students. Um, it's about how do you solve the issues associated with delivering things rapidly, especially something that was hot when it left uh, the kitchen and the recipient was still likely to be hot when it gets there. So a lot of uh, issues associated with that, um, and they're using drones to, to do it. Interesting experiment, um, and it's going to uh, necessitate a lot of innovation in the capabilities of, of the whole system, um, and in particular, uh, the drones. Now, it's going to need capabilities beyond the kind of low-cost stuff you can buy today. I was in Fry's at the weekend buying some cables, um, and I kind of took a stroll down the drone aisle, which is quite long, uh, and you can pay 30 bucks for a drone, you can pay $1,000 for a drone. I mean, there, there's a ton of them out there. Um, relatively simple devices to do this kind of thing um, is going to require innovation. I think drones are, are pretty cool. I don't spend a lot of time playing around with them myself, but I think they hold a lot of promise uh, as a disruptive technology. The kind of drones you see today are, are largely recreational. They're not being used that much um, in commercial uh, applications because the military are, are big on them. Um, but the regulations around using drones for commercial uh, purposes are, are being relaxed. Uh, just over the summer, uh, the FAA enacted some new rules which uh, relax the, the restrictions. You can now fly a commercial drone up to 100 miles an hour. That's a lot faster than you can legally drive a car on the road around here. Um, you don't have to have a pilot's license anymore. There's, a, there's an easier way of, of becoming a pilot um, of one of these things. Um, but you still need to fly it within line of sight. Now, that will probably change over time. They're letting people experiment with that, issuing waivers to people. Uh, and ultimately, I think we will get to the point where drones are being used in many, many applications, and, and of course, delivery being one of them. 
But when you get to that point where drones really are truly autonomous and flying around out of line of sight of somebody ultimately controlling it, um, drones go from being this kind of recreational thing, a remote controlled toy, let's face it, uh, to a safety critical system that's going to require a ton of intelligence in it in order to operate and operate safely. It's going to need to operate online, offline, be connected to a network, be connected to a person, cameras, the whole thing. It's going to need a lot more uh, computing within it. If you do go and buy one of those uh, drones in Fry's right now uh, and take it apart, um, you're going to find that there's a microcontroller in there and there are hundreds of drones out there based on Cortex-M3, Cortex-M4, um, running the algorithms that are uh, looking at the accelerometers, balancing the thing, uh, communicating with uh, the smartphone or controller uh, over some form of RF. So it's complex. The algorithms are pretty impressive, keeping it level and uh, everything. Uh, but it's a relatively simple device from a computing standpoint. So to get to fully autonomous, that's going to have to change. Uh, the drone of tomorrow is going to need uh, much more. It's going to need to run a much more sophisticated software stack. Uh, it's going to need to download maps into it as it's flying around. It's going to need to talk to a, a network. It's going to need to augment what it's told in advance of the location it's going to with what it can detect uh, in its surroundings itself. And to do that, it's going to need a, a lot of sensors in it and probably cameras um, to, to look at what's going on um, and require a lot more sophisticated software running uh, AI type algorithms to make sense of everything and operate in a safe way and then communicate back into the cloud what it's just done, what it's seen, so that the next drone that comes along has got an even better sense of uh, the environment that it's flying into. So a lot of ways in which uh, uh, the capability of drones and the computing power in drones is going to need to increase. Of course that runs off a battery so it's got to be low power and we're going to see those improvements that are made um, spill over into other applications. All of that learning is going to benefit uh, other applications and self-driving cars is a great example because the challenges of drones are very similar to the challenges of uh, making a car self-driving. Of course, you've got to worry about three dimensions with a drone, but uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the basic uh, algorithms you've got to solve are very, very similar. So in all of this, you know, we see machine learning uh, as critical. We see computer vision uh, as critical. Um, and that's why we're increasing our investment in this area. Uh, we think that uh, sensing and autonomy are going to be key capabilities uh, for the Internet of Things generally. And we're going to see those, you know, drones and cars of course, see lots of other um, applications uh, as well. Let's take agriculture for a moment. Um, I think IoT can have huge benefits in the improvement of agriculture as this planet gets older, more middle class, um, there's going to be enormous strains on just feeding everyone and uh, using water efficiently and IoT sensors are going to help with that. But driving costs down so food ends up on our tables at low cost um, is also important. And so autonomous vehicles being used to uh, gather crops are going to become uh, really important. Now, some advances are happening there already. We're, we're starting to see that and we're seeing it in other uh, use cases too, anywhere where you know, it's maybe remote, it's dangerous, like an oil rig or a big uh, open pit mine. Uh, we're starting to see uh, autonomous vehicles and they've all got the same problems. They need to sense what's going on, detect the unexpected and make a very intelligent response um, as a result of everything that they're seeing. So to get to this point where these, uh, these objects can be truly autonomous and uh, totally safe at the same time, um, it's going to require a lot of advance, a lot of uh, innovation. And we're not going to wake up one day and suddenly find that all the cars on the road of Santa Clara and San Jose are suddenly driving themselves around. It's going to require a continuous uh, development of technology, a continuous step of advances in technology to get there. So this, this, this concept of continual small breakthroughs, we've seen um, entirely through ARM's history. If I take you back about 20 years or so, uh, we announced a product called uh, ARM7 TDMI, maybe uh, many of you have, uh, have used that in a design, you've probably all used it in the end product, uh, as it uh, ended up in virtually every cell phone uh, back in the 90s. Uh, but when we, when we developed that, uh, we were looking at a couple of specific problems that we were trying to solve. Um, 
digital cell phones were just coming about. Uh, they had more sophisticated software, so they wanted a high-performance 32-bit processor. Uh, but when you compile the code, the code was ended up, or the binary ended up being really big, so you needed a lot of memory. System costs went up. And we thought about that. We came up with a way of, of compressing the code to get the system cost back down. We also needed to debug the system, and we found a way of uh, abusing the JTAG interface on a chip to serially get data in and out um, and make uh, debugging an embedded processor just like what it was uh, when processors were standalone chips that plugged into circuit boards. Again, when I was at university, if you wanted to debug a processor system, you had an in circuit emulator. It's a box about the size of a filing cabinet that you could take the chip out, plug this thing in, and tap away on it. We well, can't do that clearly if a processor is embedded and that's where a lot of stuff and we've made uh, um, announcements this week about um, improvements in, in debug, you know, that, that's a, a constant theme for us. So these were, were two things that were uh, seemed kind of relatively small at the time but uh, through our history we're actually part of a, a succession of developments of technology. A succession that has led to uh, just an explosion of embedded devices and the ability to put an embedded computer anywhere and everywhere. Um, and that is making a huge impact. Now we need to keep that going. We, we're uh, totally aware of that and that is why we are doubling down on our technology uh, investment. When I look through just this year, um, over the, the year to date, and look at the, the products that we've launched, uh, that's a result of R&D that's been going on for many years, um, I think we've delivered you know, amongst the most comprehensive lineup of technology uh, in the first 10 months of this year than we ever have. New platform for uh, advanced mobile devices, uh, real-time processors for autonomous vehicles, um, uh, new embedded processors, and of course, uh, Embed Cloud. So we're working on uh, accelerating this roadmap, uh, as we talked about yesterday. Um, and one of the areas particularly we're working on is security, uh, because I think security is one of the biggest issues that we face as an industry. And you only have to look at that recent news. I was working on this presentation on Friday, and up pops up this news story about uh, the DNS server in the US being taken down by a denial of service attack. And what was interesting about that was it wasn't PCs being taken over to do this, it was IoT devices. It was devices in the home that had next to no security in them that had been hijacked to perform this attack. Uh, and that's a pretty scary thing. It really does bring home uh, the advance that has to go on in making IoT devices secure. So a lot of challenges that we face uh, as an industry. Um, and I think one of the, the best ways to, uh, uh, to really explore the uh, security strengths and weaknesses of your product, if you're working on anything that requires some degree of security, um, is to go and hire somebody external, go and hire a hacker to test your product. I can tell you, your team will tell you it's brilliant. Go and get somebody else external to try and break it and they'll probably find some issues there. Um, now, we, uh, we're, we're kind of exploring this theme further this week and tomorrow uh, we have Charlie Miller uh, up on stage giving a keynote. He's the guy that uh, infamously hacked the Jeep, took over the braking system while it's being driven. Pretty terrifying. Uh, so he's going to talk about that. So I think uh, security, big, big issue. We're, we're investing a lot in that. It's a very broad technology uh, and it's one that has horizontal applications. We need a technology uh, a security solution for all types of products. So it's a horizontal, it's, it's something that, that impacts everything. And to get to these horizontal solutions often requires focusing on a vertical. And within R, uh, we drive a lot of our technology development around specific verticals. And we're going to continue to do that. So we're going to continue to work on mobile, where making processes high performance and small and, and low power and integrating video and graphics and imaging, all of those, those things spill over into other applications. If your TV has a, is a smart TV, then almost certainly the processor that's in it started out life in a mobile phone. Uh, mobile is going to continue to drive technology. Um, we're going to drive around uh, infrastructure to deliver next generation networking and cloud service because that drives a lot of performance. Uh, and of course we're going to drive IoT. That drives ultra low cost, tiny, tiny processors, ultra efficient radio communication, and uh, drive solutions around this distributed security problem uh, that I was talking about. So these are the building blocks that we're working on and, and ways in which we're going about delivering them. 
And what that's going to lead to is a continuation of this Cambrian explosion of devices. What kind of devices? I don't know. Uh, if you've got some spare time, what I'd like um, is, is this. Um, yeah, my, I operate off my smartphone constantly. There are times when I need some bigger screen real estate. So if any of you could knock this up in the next couple of months, I would appreciate that. Um, but whether it is this, uh, whether it's something else, whatever you choose to work on, um, we're committed to delivering those building blocks. It all comes from the tools and the building blocks that everybody else can go and innovate around. We're going to make them better, lower power, higher performance, continue to work on driving cost out to enable uh, innovation. So we are committed to continuing our role uh, in the, the evolution of all of this technology. We're committed to our business model based around partnership and committed to increasing the investment in our R&D to deliver more technology and to deliver it uh, sooner. We're committed to partnering with all of you in the industry because it is the sum of the parts that makes everything so, so phenomenal. We've got great products today, but there is so much more we can do together in the future. So Arm in the last couple of months might have changed hands. We may have a new owner, but you heard it from me today. You heard it from Massa yesterday. Together, we are committed to continuing the great work that we've done over the last 25 years, continuing to work with you so that jointly we can deliver the technology of the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Simon.